So we're called Wellspring Forest Farm. We produce a lot of different things, uh, mushrooms being our main cash crop actually, both out in the woods and also in some indoor production. Um, uh, maple syrup is something we must do if we live in our region of the world because it's such a unique and wonderful time to welcome in the, the spring. Uh, we'll talk a bit about our pasture lamb and duck, which is really what shows up in the civil pasture systems. And then we do a bit of elderberry. It's kind of a new thing in North America to value the medicinal benefits of elderberry. So we're finding that to be of interest. Um, my 92-year-old grandmother now consumes elderberry every day and swears it's what's keeping her going. So uh, we've actually named our elderberry after her. Uh, and then we do a bit of education and, and now agritourism, which I've heard a little bit of discussion here, but it seems like something that farms more and more are uh, bringing into their systems. I think it's a really good thing to consider because you can, uh, you can give folks an experience of that rural lifestyle. And a lot of folks that are living in cities, which is most humans now, want to wanna have that experience. So we're finding that to really work for us as well. But I'd say that uh, our overarching principle and vision is that we, we try to develop a farm that's really in the image of a forest. And what we mean by that is the farm we walked on uh, when we found it was uh, pretty beat up. The soil was very compacted, the nutrients very deficient. The water was pooling and running off and eroding everywhere we could see. The plant life was quite low in diversity. We had a lot of those problematic plants that are indicati indica in indicative of uh, of sort of de poor and deficient soils, some of those uh, thorny and um, sort of noxious plants growing throughout the landscape. And, and that was what the, the, the legacy of the previous farmer had left. And, and our vision is what we want to leave in our footsteps when we are long gone is a forest in our, in, in our wake. And, and so the forest is what we find ourselves always thinking about and always orienting to. And so anywhere that's an existing woodlot, we try to support and manage as best we can for its, its health and well-being. And Basically, anywhere there's not a tree, eventually we would like to put a tree, uh, with, within reason. Because if we put too many trees, then we won't be able to graze the animals. So it's all about a balance of, of those systems. So we have a bit of a mix of land here. The orange in the middle there is the original holding. We had about 10 acres. We just acquired another 12 that we're working in, and that's mostly a forested area. Uh, and then this, the, the red box at the top there is, uh, is where we're um, leasing land, and that's a really common practice. A lot of farmers in the U.S. are leasing more land than they actually um, own, and and have a, a lot to uh, a lot of landowners that don't want to use the land productively, and so uh, we're having a nice relationship uh, working. So it's about uh, 35 acres total here, and then we have another uh, 15 acres up the road that we lease and, and tap maple trees on. Uh, for us, it's been really important as part of our understanding of where we are in the world and in the land to really learn about the history and, and frankly, the trauma that associates and is embedded in the landscape. So we are on Haudenosaunee traditional Native American territory specifically Goyankono or Cayuga. And the Cayuga Nation, uh, you can see the arrow there, it's about where our farm is, are people that we're learning about and building relationship with and learning about the ways that they have stewarded this landscape for centuries and thousands of years. And it turns out that those ways are pretty much what we call agroforestry now. And so we can learn from that wisdom and I know there's that embedded history in the landscape as well. And I don't think we should ignore that. I think we should learn from it and seek to understand it a bit more in our landscape, a lot of folks don't think about, we think about fires in the U.S. as being in the West, but uh, low intensity fires that were actually started and maintained by the indigenous people that were a really common way to manage the forest. Now they weren't grazing domestic livestock, but what they essentially did was burn out the understory, thin out some of those young trees, burn up all that brush in the, in the, uh, in the bottom of the forest that unlocks a lot of nutrients and paved the way for a lot of the early horticultural crops, the berries and fruits and things and essentially created a park-like setting, something that looks very much like what we think of civil pasture, where we have a tree canopy and a grass understory. And of course, we've lost a lot of that because with um, European settler colonization of the land, we brought the plow, and we looked at the plow as the ultimate tool for the landscape. And it's actually really embedded when you start to look at the history of the landscape and what it meant to have land and to claim land in the New World. And in many cases, to make a land claim in North America, you had to improve the landscape. And improving the landscape meant remove all the trees off the landscape, make it plowable, essentially. And if you look at old survey maps, you'll find uh, lots of labels that say wasteland. And wasteland generally referred to forest, and it referred to wetlands. And these are actually ecologically some of the most valuable ecosystems. And if we were all step off the northeast uh, area of the country that, that we live in, a forest would, would inevitably grow back one way or the other. <clears throat> 
So, you know, we, we keep this in mind that we have a long tradition. It still shows up in a lot of our patterns of thinking about what agriculture is. We have these stark lines between where the pasture or the field ends and the forest begins. And agroforestry is really an invitation to start to blur those lines and, and blend those a bit and bring trees into the farm landscape. And there's just uh, too much research on the benefits of agroforestry to get into today. Um, a lot of amazing research with Ag Forward through the European Union. A lot of research in Canada, as well as in North America, demonstrates essentially in any agricultural system bringing trees into the mix benefits both the environment and often the bottom line as well. So this is a, a graphic from one publication uh, that, that talks about um, with crops, with field crops, you can get between a 6% and a 56% increase in yield just by adding windbreaks into, into windy uh, agricultural farms. And, and that variation is really depends on the cropping system, depends on the soil, depends on all sorts of things. So looking around and experiencing a bit of the, the Irish landscape, what we see is there's potential for a lot of these tree systems to be put in, and there's already a starting point. You have existing hedgerows, you have existing edges of wood, you have all these kind of pieces there, and we could just perhaps put a bit more value to that, bring those back into the picture. So I think in particular, there's a lot of civil pasture practices, or excuse me, agroforestry practices. It's kind of like a big umbrella that all these kind of different things fit under. I think that windbreaks, I think that thinking about riparian, which means really water areas and, and water plantings and working with water um, seems to be important, considering I was soaked head to toe yesterday. Uh, that seems to be a persistent feature of this landscape. And then silvo pasture, which is what we'll drill a bit deeper into, which is really uh, working with animals and trees in the, in the farm landscape. So just to summarize, a lot of benefits to these things. Um, and and agroforestry really, uh, systems really rate right at the top of these uh, kind of different qualities that often conservationists or policymakers or farmers themselves are looking to add to their landscape. And when you add trees, you kind of start to, to really buffer those things up. So the question is, how do we add them in a way that allows us to do the daily work of the things we're doing, whether that's um, hand work, whether that's machine work, and whether our machines are big or small, all those kind of different things. Particularly with carbon sequestration, there's a lot of ongoing debate within climate change about practices that are seeking to reduce tillage, about practices of managed grazing and intensive grazing systems and all the carbon benefits. And there's certainly carbon benefits there. But hands down, time and time again, once a system adds trees in, it becomes net carbon positive. It becomes a repository long term for carbon in the landscape. And there's really no beating what trees do in the landscape in terms of carbon. And what we're finding on our farm is there's an added benefit for ourselves in the day to day as we experience more and more extreme rain events. We get heavier and heavier rains coming at unpredictable times of year. We get dry spells that we never used to have. Our, our rain is not as much as, as we see here on the island, but it's generally evenly distributed throughout the year. And, and that's not really the case anymore, and it's not likely to, to stay that way. So systems we've used on our farm, just to give you an example, silvo pasture. We have some windbreaks. That was one of our first plantings that I'll show you some pictures of. Forest gardening is a, is a practice of kind of intensive management where we look at an orchard as a, as a forest ecosystem and, and plant understory plants in there. All of our waterways are active sort of restoration products, uh, projects where we look to uh, plant trees and, and restore natural flows of water and, and have that benefit the landscape as opposed to essentially uh, ripping erosion through the landscape, which is what it's essentially done for the past 50 years. And then forest farming, which is actually producing pro crops underneath the forest canopy. So for us, maple syrup and mushrooms uh, fit into that scheme. So we encountered this landscape that had been uh, sort of largely, uh, any open land was, was sort of extracted. There's about 50 to 60 years of hay harvest coming off that land and, and really no clear indication that the previous farmer had put anything back on. So when you're harvesting uh, grasses or hay or silage, you're taking fertility off the land and it's really important to return that. Um, so one of our first goals was to put animals back on the landscape to, to return some of that, that material and, and start cycling it a bit better. We also had just a ton of uh, sort of overgrown, brushy areas that were impenetrable and actually were so thickly uh, grown together with a mess of, of vegetation and vines and all sorts of things that they weren't really beneficial habitat for birds or animals or anything as much as they uh, were also not very beneficial for our, our purposes on the farm. So this is an example of one of the riparian areas where the water was essentially just a floodplain. Every time it would rain, it would just flood essentially uh, about a couple acres of the farm because the water just didn't really simply have anywhere to go. But I think the biggest difference is that um, unlike goats, they, we have a good agreement. Goats seem to want to get up in the morning and try to get out of the fence. That's their number one objective for the day. 
And the sheep, generally, if we give them good forage, they'll, they'll stay put where we want them to be. And so what's beautiful about this animal is they, uh, as a breed and also uh, as a sort of a culture within their herd, and I think that sort of um, culture mentality is really important and, and can be unique even w within the same breed, um, they take quite well equally to woody vegetation as well as to grass. And so we essentially fenced out those scrubby areas and, and had them go to work. Um, and this was quite a, a sort of biblical experience, that we, one could say, because it was 40 days where they were n there was no pasture and just this woody vegetation. And so we put them on the green stuff, and, and they loved uh, being in the, in the shade and in the cool shelter of this. And, and they did quite well. And at the end of the grazing season... Our lamb hanging weights were no different than any other year, which is, would be our indication of sort of productivity. So no real change. And we said, wow, that's quite a blessing, but boy, next time this drought comes, we've got to be a little more prepared. That same uh, windbreak, that willow windbreak, which you can see here, uh, this, this, uh, this drought year, we really just, anything that was green, we were, we were willing to give to the sheep. That's how we felt at this point, um, even if it meant sort of setting ourselves back. But these trees had actually grown quite well. This was their... Uh, their fourth season, you can see about half the vegetation is above the browse height, which means the plant can continue to photosynthesize and grow and put energy into its roots. So we let the girls uh, uh, feed on these, these willow, and one of the things we noticed is that they didn't quite feed as aggressively as on some of the other vegetation. They actually fed for a bit, and then they backed off. They looked for something else in the landscape. And so at that time, we didn't really understand why, but now we, we come to learn that willow is incredibly high in what are called condensed tannins, which is one of those secondary compounds that as a grazer, we need to start learning about because all these kind of secondary compounds offer so many benefits to our, to our animals. Condensed tannins, as it turns out, from research in, a lot of research in Australia uh, and New Zealand, um, uh, suppress parasite growth in the rumen. They're actually a medicinal compound in that sense. Willow is also the source of salicylic acid, which is the original composition of aspirin, and so it's a natural painkiller. And as it turns out, those condensed tannins also slow down the rumen digestion, and they actually reduce the methane output of these animals. And this is a wonderful tree, and this is a stick that we can stick in the ground and start to plant, and it can also serve as a windbreak, and, and it persists today and does quite well, and is really, we see this as them sort of feeding themselves at the medicinal trough of things. Um, and that's quite unique. This is what most animals are experiencing in our country, right? This is the kind of uh, experience they have. And they don't have options. They, don't, they can't go to the pharmacy here. And they get fed what we like to call in the States a total mixed ration, the TMR, the magical formula that tries to figure out all the nutritional needs that every animal uh, optimally wants and then feed them the exact same thing. And we'll talk about Fred Provenza. It was mentioned in the previous talk. Fred Provenza is a wonderful resource, and I really recommend if you're a livestock person to look him up and understand more about his work. One of the things he did is, is uh, study animals and note that individuals on a daily basis, on, even on an hourly by hourly basis, have different nutritional needs. And they can't be met through a total mixed ration. And it's the same way that if we fed you all a pill or a powder, which we have products for, for human consumption now, right, that have the, the complete package, we know that that fully isn't going to meet our nutritional needs. Right? We all need something different, and it's not just about nutrition, it's also about taste and, um, and the experience of eating. And so Fred actually gets into the fact that animals want to experience the landscape and, and, and be able to sample foods and sort of have the buffet laid out for them. And we want to let them decide what's going on. So for us, this starts to reorient our thinking. And my background before farming was really an ecological, uh, exploring the natural world and sort of ecology. And it was really curious to me, and I, I think Fred talks about this a lot in his, his work as well, that uh, we don't often think of domestic animals in the same way we think of wild animals. So we look at behavior, we look at feeding habits, and we look at habitat for wild animals, but when it comes to the farm, we just say, well, we just need to feed them so many pounds of grass or so many this or that, and, and we'll be good. And that's not really how they have evolved, and we're really missing the boat, I think, when we do that. So we start to think of ourselves as creating habitat. So what kind of habitat do these animals want to experience on the landscape? Well, any livestock farmer can tell you that any time an animal has access to shade, they're going to sit there and take time, especially when they're digesting after that morning meal, and it might be a bit hot in the afternoon, and they're going to seek out that shade and, and, and do their uh, ruminating there. If there's a chance for them to, to strip a tree bare, they will probably go and strip that tree as much as possible, right? They, they have an attraction to trees for, for certain reasons. So we pay attention to those things, and we don't necessarily give them free reign, but we give them access to it. And it's, con it's controlled access, and one of the ways is we give them time in a paddock, and then we move them to another place, and we don't give them access for too long. And that's really important with trees. 
because they'll just keep, continue to go after it if you, if you don't let it. They, some of these gals have gotten really good at climbing on each other's backs be, to be able to reach the vegetation, right? They learn quickly. And this is their feasting on Robinia, which is also known as black locusts, which is a really interesting tree, not native to here. They say it's not native to where I come from either. It's actually on a blacklist. If you sell a tree, uh, Robinia in New York State, you have to put a label on it that says this is a really dangerous tree. But it produces rot-resistant wood. It produces fence posts in five to seven years. It fixes nitrogen in the soil. And it's, the nutritional value of its leaves is basically the same as alfalfa. It's incredibly dense nutrition. And it doesn't matter if it's a drought year, it doesn't matter if it's a flood year, those trees look just as vibrant as ever. So there's a really important, uh, I think, uh, implication to that when we think about a changing climate. The other thing that we notice, and we always seem to have a fun uh, go in the winter when we think we've got all our lambing figured out and we got all the ram lambs out at the right time and nobody should be giving birth early. Well, somebody always does, it seems like. So this was one of our moms uh, one year in January, who, uh, and they always like to have births in the worst weather possible. So we always get this like nasty, wet, heavy snow, and, and the mom's like, yeah, this seems like a good day. Uh, and so here she is, and we couldn't find her. We didn't know where she was, and we finally found her in this brushy area in, in one of the dense uh, areas that we thought eventually we'd clear out, that this stuff was a waste and in the way. But it was an incredibly important shelter. It may have been the, the difference between life and death for her as she's giving birth to her young. So this is what habitat looks like. And um, if you're not familiar with um, Greg Judy's work on grazing, uh, I'd really recommend digging into that. One of the things he talks about is that if we're growing and raising livestock, that we're not actually uh, uh, livestock farmers as much as grass farmers. And, and maybe even further than that, we're solar farmers. We're actually trying to capture the maximum amount of light and turn it into plant material that our animals can benefit from. So these are the stomata on a leaf. These are the solar, solar collectors that are the most efficient collectors known on Earth. We're not going to beat this with any solar technology in our lifetime. This is, this is a project that's been you know, being worked on for millions of years, right? And when we combine grasses and trees, we get all the benefits of those different types of solar collection because really trees at the end of the day are what uh, are the best at doing this work and storing this in lots of different things, not just leaves, but in wood and in fruit and in nuts and in all the wonderful things. And if we're talking about carbon sequestration, a lot of times what people are thinking about is, is wood and is organic matter. But we have to remember that um, that's just one piece of the puzzle, it's just one individual. And I'll, I'll show the same picture. This is a wonderful picture that gets used all the time because it's well done from the University of Aberdeen where they study mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi cling to the roots of these trees and increase the root mass by 75% in some cases. And what's amazing about mycorrhizal fungi strands, all the white strands on there, is they can, they can wrap around individual grains of soil. Tree roots cannot get that microscopic. And so you have this harvesting mechanism working in partnership with the tree, harvesting minerals, harvesting nutrients, harvesting water, and trading that to the tree for sugars, which of course the fungus can't produce because it's not a, a photosynthetic organism. So when we have trees, we have mycorrhizal fungi. Our pastures, our open fields, generally are more bacteria dominated in terms of their microbiology. But when we add trees in, we start to have a fungal presence in those ecosystems. And there's a lot of different methods to bring more mycorrhizal fungi into the system. But one really effective way is if you're planting trees is to do what's called a mycorrhizal root dip, which kind of looks like a, a, a slimy glue that you purchase, you mix up, and then you dip your trees in before you sort of inoculating those trees before you're putting them into the ground. So we have those trees and that long-term storage and the fungus, and then if we bring the grassland systems in, it seems like uh, we share some of the similar pictures in these, right? So we have these perennial grass systems that, um, if we're grazing properly, uh, can put a lot of carbon into the soil as well. So most tree biomass, most tree carbon is above ground, but most grass carbon is below ground. So the partnership of those two, silvopasture, really gives us the maximum carbon benefit. But we cannot have the benefits of those. Those grasses have all evolved with grazing ruminants all throughout the world. And if you haven't seen the old BBC series, Planet Earth, the Grasslands episode is, is a wonderful testament, a wonderful explanation of all the, the ways the herbivores and grasslands have evolved. So with these building blocks, we can start to think about habitat, and we can start to think about silvopasture. And what we've really learned on our farm is our role is not to um, be uh, anything but the conductor. We're not actually doing the work. We're not photosynthesizing sunlight into grass. 
were maybe planting the trees, but the trees are doing most of the growing work and most of the storage and all that. And the animals are doing most of the work cycling all of this together. And our role is to get everybody in the right place at the right time, just like a conductor. So let's look at a couple examples of how this has been going on for a long time. This, is, this might seem like a new thing, but this is actually an old thing, and we could just call this farming if we looked far enough back in time. This, isn't, this, this is novel only because we sort of abandoned it uh, collectively. So this is a picture, this is a, fr a French painting from the 14th century showing the practice of what's called panage. And panage is bringing pigs into woodlands, specifically acorn-producing woodlands, at specific times of the year for very short windows to have those pigs clean up the nuts. And a lot of folks that get into civil pasture say, well, I run pigs through my woods and that's civil pasture. And the problem is, is they often think about these examples, but they might run their pigs through the, se the, the, the wood all season, but there's no food for the pigs. And what do the pigs do? They rummage up the ground, they compact everything, they kind of make a mess. So if we're going to use pigs to clean up nuts, we've got to remember it's only a short window of time in there. Let's zoom over to Japan. This is a, a, at least a 400-year-old system. If you look for a video series called Woodlanders, woodlanders.com, you'll see a video about this and a number of other wonderful videos about um, different agroforestry practices. And so this is an uh, uh, oak coppice. This is called the she tree in Japan, but it's an oak. And these are cut on a coppice rotation. They're grown every, uh, they're cut every 15 to 20 years in about quarter acre you know, clear cuts. They're allowed to regenerate. The, the, uh, the, the science that documents the incredible um, biodiversity that, that this supports doing a rotation like that, where you have uh, woodlands in different stages of succession from just cut last year to just cut two years ago to five, you know, imagine every single year down the road you have a different composition in there. And these foresters in here are cutting these because they're using them for, for shiitake log production. This is how logs have traditionally been done is in coppice systems. But the farmer, you know, waiting 15 years in a woodland, there's a couple problems there with, with sort of profitability. There's a cost to maintaining this land and there's not a lot going on. And so what actually has happened traditionally was cattle were grazed in those woodland settings, which produced a lot of underground uh, understory forage and, and grasses and things like that. And even at the right stocking density, they found the cows could help prune the initial shoots off the oak and help with a bit of that work as well. Not, not, not as clean as the farmer could do, but actually would do quite a good job of helping to, to get those trees to final, uh, the final stage. And um, uh, oak leaves in general are very high in tannins as well, so inevitably the cattle were also benefiting from a bit of sampling. And what we see on the farms that we visit is if there's access to oak leaves, they'll eat a bit, but again, they'll kind of they'll, they'll slow down. It's not, it's not the main course, it's a side dish. Here's the dehesa or the montado. These are traditional silvopasture pasture systems in Spain and Portugal. So the cork tree, the oak cork, is from the montado system. And these are kind of open oak savannas. Now, this is a very different ecosystem than you or I are from. This is a dryland ecosystem, but it's a pretty amazing system. It's a sheep-based uh, system where uh, either the uh, oak was harvested for timber, or if it was a cork oak, it was harvested and used for cork for a long time. And the famous character of these is always this black Iberian pig. This is the Yama Nibirco. This is the, the world-class famous smoked pork that is probably the most expensive pork and maybe some of the most delicious you could find, comes from these systems and these acorn-finished pigs. Missing from this story often is that these pigs, again, only came in at certain periods of time at the end of the season to collect the, the nuts. It was mostly merino sheep that actually grazed and maintained the system throughout the growing season. And what I think is interesting about all the research that's been done with this in the Montanza in particular is, is the cultural relationship to it. So the pig harvest became a community harvest, became a festival, became the ritual washing of all the parts of the animal in the creek and the, the creation of the sausages and putting up all this material for the winter. This is originally uh, a cultural festival. Now people travel just to, to visit and experience this, right? So we're embedded in something that's not just about farming but also about the culture of farming. And then finally, if we look th uh, through another example, this is uh, back to Fred Provenz's work. Him and Michel Miro wrote a book um, and studied and followed traditional French herders in the Alps. And there's still French herding schools that, that one can attend and actually do this. And when I first encountered this, I thought it was interesting, but I didn't have a lot of application because I'm generally not grazing thousands of sheep on thousands of acres. But the lessons they actually learned um, from these herders really do apply to our farm landscapes. And one of the most interesting things is that these herders are often seen in the wider culture as sort of peasants that don't have a lot of intelligence, that sort of just, you know, 
randomly put their sheep out in the landscape. It's a very simple job, but there's probably nothing more that could be, there's nothing that could be more sophisticated. Uh, and we know that as farmers, we often get seen as being, doing simple work, but you know, going from fixing a tractor to just fixing some plumbing to moving animals to pulling a sheep out of a, a ewe you know, in one day, uh, it's quite sophisticated, as we know. And so the analogy they drew is that these herders are like chefs. They actually sequence the meals for the sheep because they found that if they get the right amount of proteins, the right amount of woody stuff, the right amount of grasses, and the right combination, they get the best and highest intake and the least amount of disease. And so they are like a chef crafting a meal. So there's an appetizer, there's a stimulator, there's a main course, and there's a dessert. And they go through it in great detail in this book. So if you're interested in that, you can check out the art and science of shepherding. Fred Provenza went on to do an incredible amount of research, as was mentioned in the previous presentation. And if you go to behave.net, you can kind of see a summary of a lot of these different things around animal behavior that are really important and feel like I completely missed when we got into to grazing. So we're still learning a lot of those things. So civil pasture um, is, is interesting as an agricultural solution in particular with animals because when we combine the grazing grassland ecosystems and the tree ecosystems and the action of the animals, we get the best of all those worlds together. And there's a book called Drawdown, which um, is an international collection of scientists who looked at, did the math, and calculated sort of the top 100 solutions to climate change across all sectors. And it turns out that civil pasture turned out as number one in agriculture and number nine out of all 100 solutions. I think number one or two is actually like reducing our food waste. Like there's a lot of little easy things like not throwing away so much food that would actually uh, do even more for the climate. But in terms of agriculture, civil pasture really shows up as quite a bit on the top. And it's actually being practiced in a lot of the world, mostly, um, mostly in South and Central America and parts of Asia are where we see a lot of civil pasture happening. Uh, and so we can really draw upon this. Um, if you want to get into the math and like kind of sitting with all the numbers of carbon, this is a nice starting point. AFTA is the Association for Temperate Agroforestry, mostly based in North America. And they have an article called Carbon Budget Calculation for Civil Pasture Systems. So it gives you a bit of a primer on what that looks like, if that's your goal. We had a good conversation at the class yesterday about the fact that uh, just this fall we had uh, some announcements from your government saying we're going to plant you know, millions and millions of trees over the next uh, several decades in order to curb climate change. And in New York State, at a very similar time, we actually had almost the exact same declaration. And if we haven't dug into this, I'll tell you, you know, a lot of that looks like plantations. A lot of it looks like things that uh, might serve the forest industry more than the farm industry. And there's a group w with knots, and there's also a group of us working in New York State to see how at least a percentage of that can benefit farms and farmers directly. I think farmers should be paid to put trees on their landscape for carbon, and that those trees should be what we call working trees, meaning they do something else for the farm as well. And there's ways to manage and, and have these, uh, these trees work as they sequester carbon in the landscape. So we'll leave that conversation for another time. With civil pasture, we can, we can look at converting existing woodlands, and we can also look at planting trees in pasture. The big difference from a carbon standpoint is that really, unless when we're removing woody vegetation, we're often, at least in the short term, having a, a carbon loss. Although that ecosystem in the long term might be a lot more productive and it might have a lot of other benefits, like some of the overgrown stuff I mentioned on our farm. Versus the trees and pasture, when we're adding trees into those systems, it's kind of always a net gain in terms of carbon. So I know it's a, it's a bit different here. You have a, 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 when we look at comparing Ireland to, to New York State, 10 or 11% forest cover here, right? Uh, a lot of that in timber plantations, is, is, as far as I understand. So there's a lot of room here to put trees into the landscape, and I think in ways that can benefit and work for farms. Um, just as a comparison, in New York and the Northeast U.S., which New York is about two Irelands put together, uh, we're at about 70% tree cover. We have a lot of, well, a lot of woody vegetation. Um, a lot of it's pretty young, secondary regrowth. Uh, but we have quite a bit of forest cover, um, but it's in various stages of, of care and of, of practice. So back to our kind of orchestration, all the kind of pieces that we put together. One, the number one thing that we found on our farm uh, is good rotational grazing is, is an essential starting point for, for good civil pasture. And part of it's because I mentioned before, if we let the animals hang out with the trees for too long, they're just going to keep hammering on them. But it's also, I, I talked to a farmer here who has been experimenting with rotational grazing, who has seen doubling, tripling, quadrupling of his stocking rate. Because what happens when we rotate the, the pasture and we let it rest is we get a lot more productivity per acre. 
in terms of our grass. And it might seem like more work, but we start to do the math, and I think it's really worth it. And it's also worth it ecologically, because if we really want to move animals through the landscape, we have to let that landscape rest and recover, or else those grasses can't put carbon into the soil. So if we're continuously grazing spaces or grazing them for too long, we might have a bit of a problem if we're interested in carbon. And we're lucky because my grandfather did grazing in the Midwest in Illinois, and he had access to wood posts and metal wire. But now we have an incredible array of products that we can fold and roll and move very quickly and set up temporary paddocks. And once our animals are used to this, we have a good agreement, and they move into the right space at the right time. We can, we can put them in different areas and then move them on and actually let those areas rest and regenerate. So we generally move our sheep every day on the farm to a new paddock. And we generally set up our paddocks one day a week where we set up the paddocks for the week, and then we just go out in the morning. It's part of our chores to move them on to the next thing. I know farmers in the States, there's one south of me who uh, has figured out a profitable business model for doing sheep and cows. He does them together. He calls it a flerd, a flock and a herd. And he moves them up to four times a day. And he's doing what's called intensive mob grazing, but it's profitable for him. He's full-time on the farm. He sets up the system, and it's not a lot of extra labor once it's set up, but it He's producing a lot off a, very, a much smaller piece of land than we might be used to. So rotational grazing is all about paying attention to especially the grasses in the system. What's amazing about grasses is we have the animal who's cut off the, the vegetation at the top, maybe once, maybe twice, depending on how long they've been in there. And the grass, what it does is it draws upon its root system and it sends out what are called tillers, and it actually regenerates from the base. And this is the adaptive quality that's unique to grasses that allows them to be regrazed and regenerated all the time. They have to have that rest. So our aim on our farm, and it's never perfect, is we try to put animals on when the grass is about a foot tall, and we try to take them off when it's about four inches tall or on the third day. Because after the third day, what tends to happen is those tillers are starting to regenerate, and if the animals keep clipping them, well, now you're stressing the grass a little bit, and then if it's three more days, it's stressing a bit more, stressing a bit more. And that's, that's just the basic science of how it works. And it's never perfect. And when we started, we certainly um, didn't have enough sheep to, this is our first year, we just had a few handful of sheep to get started. Didn't have enough to do that. But it's something to consider. And the more you can rotate, and the more you can let your pastures rest, the, the greater benefit there is, whatever the number is. But there's definitely a lot of conversation about uh, mob grazing and, and seeing a lot of the benefits, both ecologically and also for the bottom line of the grazing farm. So civil pasture is not just putting animals in the woods. And this is a picture I've been using in a lot of presentations. It actually came from the Irish Times. But this is happening all over the world where animals are put into woodlots because they're often they're seen as wastelands. And they're left there for such a long time that they actually start to do quite a bit of damage to the soil and to the trees. And I've seen plenty of examples of that. And what we want to do is, again, put them in, make sure there's food for them, and then move them out and let that rest and regenerate. And so we find as we look at civil pasture that we're talking about a mixture of sort of right animal, right place, and, and getting them at the right time. But I think it's also important to revisit our habitat conversation and think about these things. I like these five freedoms of, for animal welfare that uh, show up in a number of places and, and, and provide a template for us to think about and always be improving. And animal welfare also means a more healthy and a more productive animal as well. And so all those things kind of relate, and it's an important thing for us as farmers to make sure our animals are important parts of our extended family on the farm. They're not just animal units that are producing meat or milk. That's part of the goal, but that's not the only goal. So in your silvopasture, pasture, if that's something you're interested in, I would encourage you to start with really the most marginal or overgrown or, or, or those areas of the farm, like I mentioned, that you, you haven't been thinking about. Because those are great places to start to find more productivity and do a bit of experimentation and have a bit of a low risk in terms of the, the, the um, learning curve because it, it is a learning curve in the end. So we've been constantly kind of working in these areas. So that, that first initial drought year, we kind of got enough material to keep the, the sheep happy. We'd go in there with the chainsaw, okay, and drop a tree for them occasionally, that sort of thing, but it was a bit scattered. Over time, we've gotten a little more organized. So sometimes we might uh, see some of our pruning and harvesting as an opportunity if I have 20 minutes or 15 minutes and I move them into an area and I can do a bit of pruning of a tree, like this is an old willow tree that needs a little bit of work, I might spend a little time doing that. And over time, these things start to shift. But it's not an overnight phenomenon, necessarily. And a lot of what we try to do is, is really uh, start to get access for this net fencing and put them in these areas, open up some, some more space, and then kind of continuously work on it year after year. If we're planting trees, there's a lot of different options. And, and the book that's for sale out there, and 
gets into some of these details about different ways you could plant trees, and we really have to be careful. This isn't a, a pattern that works for us on our farm with moving fence and moving machinery. Uh, it's an orchard spacing, and often that's what people think of when they plant trees in pasture. But we have to think about, you know, what is this going to look like when we plant? What is it going to look like as we manage and harvest over time? That's one of the challenges of tree-based systems is they won't look the same from year to year. They're going to change over time. So we do a lot of contour planting. We do a lot of work with contour, which is points of equal elevation on the landscape, and we plant trees in rows, and then we graze in the alleys. And then as those trees mature, we can plant in between those rows, and we can kind of shift our paddock system. And that's worked pretty well for us. We never plant as many trees as we'd like to on the farm, but we, we plant more and more every year. And there's also a, a number of sort of scattered patterns, different ways, and we talked yesterday a lot about those corners of the farm fence. You could, you could create a thicket of trees and just fence them off from the animals until they get established. It's always cheaper to fence off a group of trees than an individual tree. And trees, turns out, like to grow in, in groups. They don't like to grow individually, so they struggle a bit more when you stick them out by themselves in pasture. And they always do better when you, when you plant them in rows or in groups. And that's part about that fungal ecology in the soil. It's partially about that's how forests grow, is usually with dense plantings that thin themselves out. And so these are patterns that we can learn and sort of apply to our silvopasture. pasture. So we've learned over time, we used to think we could uh, have pretty close spacing. I think that um, I think at 30 feet between rows for sheep is actually too narrow at this point. We do more like 50 or 60 to start. You can see what our goal is, is we, fo we focus on tree species that get, get uh, above browse height and where the bark gets hardy enough in at least in under five years is our goal because we want to put the sheep back in with those trees as quickly as possible. So that really reduces the number of possible trees we can grow if those are our criteria. But it's allowing us to put trees on the landscape really rapidly. So again, we have the, the willow and then the robinia up there. Uh, uh, ready to browse after about the, the four seasons when we started to put the animals in with them. And if I put oak there, if I put black walnut, which a lot of folks want to plant where I come from, I might wait 10 or 15 years. And that's a, that's a, that's a significant difference in terms of the, the, the grazing land, the maintenance that has to go into those trees, the protection, all of that. So here's an example of that, that row of robinia. And what we like to do is plant really densely. So we don't look at what the finished size of the tree is. We recognize that some of these trees are going to probably not make it. That's how the forest grows. They, it tends the forest will put down 100,000 seeds per acre, whether that's coming from the soil or coming from the sky or coming from the trees, and those will eventually grow into only about 200 finished trees in a mature forest. So that's a big selection process. So a lot of seedlings that we put on the farm are going to die. It's just inevitable. And also, if we plant densely, we actually create the type of scenario that trees are used to growing in, which is where they have a bit of you know, a buddy on this side and a buddy on this side, and, and so they're not going to branch out as much. They're going to really focus on upward growth. And if the first 10 to 20 years of a tree's life, they want to grow up. But if you stick them by themselves in the field, they're sort of like, ah, I guess I can just kind of hang out and grow outward. And that's great for fruit trees. That's a, that's a good design for fruit trees. But a lot of these sort of broadleaf trees don't do as well in that setting. So we plant densely, and then we, and then we thin things out. So this is pre-starting uh, to thin, right, those same trees. We had a really good <laughs> success rate, no, no early mortalities, but this is, this is just four years in. We generally use uh, simple fencing. You know, this is the, the net fencing uh, to keep our sheep off the trees. This is off our elderberries. Interestingly enough, though, there's a toxic compound in elderberries, and our sheep actually don't really go after them. They do a bit of mess. They, they, they make a mess, sort of. Uh, they break branches and things, but they don't actually eat a lot of the vegetation. On my friend's farm, Angus Glen Farm, which is just up the road, he has a 400-acre, uh, uh, it's really dark, that's an Angus cattle on the right there, uh, uh, Angus uh, grazing operation, 400 acres, I'm not sure how many head now, and about 30% of his farm is in civil pasture, and he's trained them to these single strands, and he can put a single strand around a tree and keep them off of it as they graze through the landscape. So once they're used to it, it's pretty easy. This was in Virginia at a farm, this is called a 3D fence. So if deer are an issue, or, or also if you want to combine sort of protection from wild herbivores with your domestic livestock, these are really effective and pretty inexpensive to set up. Where we have a, those T-posts in the back are kind of one uh, set of double strands, and then you have this third strand out in the middle, and that creates a barrier that uh, deer don't generally want to jump over. And so they didn't have any mortality from deer, and they didn't have to do any tree tubing in this whole, in this whole field. And it was a very inexpensive way to set up that fence until those trees could get established.
So one more thing I want to share with you um, before we take some questions is uh, one of the discoveries from writing the book in Silva Pasture is that more cultures around the world, especially in dry and warm climates, um, have used trees for fodder um, than any other use. And uh, there's a lot of excitement, I think, and interest in this potential. And again, I think one of the biggest things is in a dry year, in a wet year, these trees are um, pretty much look the same. And so there's incredible value to the farmer in that kind of extreme weather scenario. But different species have different kind of nutrition, different kind of medicinal properties. So I always felt like, too, it's overwhelming if you want to plant trees on the farm to know where to start. It's overwhelming for us. And I think that um, it's very tempting to plant dozens and dozens of different species, but I'd really recommend starting simple and building out from there. And so one of our goals as farms was to look at this kind of climate resilience and start to focus on tree fodder and look at the research and see what was out there. And so we kind of put a bunch of trees through this test, all these different things. Is there research for them as fodder? Are they adaptable to a wide range of scenarios? Are they fast growing? Are they easy to propagate? Because inevitably, we need to actually be propagating some of our own trees on farm or else we're not going to keep planting because of the cost. So we might buy willow stakes for a dollar a piece, but we can now produce them on our farm for two cents a piece, and that's a huge difference. And then if they have secondary products, all the better. So when we kind of pushed a bunch of trees through that sieve, these four came up as is some of the best for the cold, temperate climate. So you got two that are native and two that are not native to here. So you can decide where you fall on that spectrum. It's really hard to beat the black locust for a lot of reasons. I don't recommend ever planting black locust in like a woodland restoration where you're not going to be actively grazing and managing it because what it tends to do is send out root suckers and, and spread. But in a grazing system, it's brilliant because you can keep the, the rows in check because your animals are going to graze any advantageous shoots that come out. And it, like I said, it's a tree alfalfa. It's a rot-resistant wood. The saying where I come from is if you use locust for a wood, uh, for a fence post, the way you know when it's time to replace it is you put the post in, you put a rock on top. And when the rock decomposes, it's time to replace the post, right? I mean, this is carbon sequestration. This is going to last for at least 100 years in productive use on the farm. It is the replacement for pressure-treated lumber. It performs better than pressure-treated lumber. So what was interesting is then when we look at sort of how often it's described that we want a good mix of things in our pasture, well, the willow and the poplar are essentially analogous to grasses in our grazing system. The willow being a bit different because of the condensed tannins, so it's, it's a little more of a medicinal. The black locust really is a legume, and there's other legumes out there to play with. I, I learned from a farmer here that gorse used to be ground up and fed to sheep, right? So there's other plants in the landscape that have high protein, um, and then the forbs are sort of the, the flowering plants that provide a lot of the nutrients and minerals. And mulberry has a phenomenal amount of, of nutrients and minerals. So if I were to summarize, you know, these plants have a lot to offer the landscape. And they're not just a uh, standalone on the tree fodder circuit, but they can be used in other ways as well. So we have these kind of benefits. Um, if you visit our, uh, the Silva Pasture Book website, there's a whole webinar, just a sort of recorded presentation just on tree fodder. And if you want to dig in, that's a good way to continue to, to learn about this. But I'll just share one example to close from a farm I visited in Canada that I think is integrating the tree crops and the environmental restoration and the productivity in a really novel way that we're looking at now as a solution for dairy farming in, the, in, in New York, which is going through a bit of a crisis. So, here we are on Prince Edward Island in Canada. And this is a beautiful island up in the Maritimes. I didn't realize until I visited that this is a, a, an intense potato producing island. Like the island is essentially covered in potato farms. And, um, and it's also really well known for mussels. So you go to a nice restaurant often uh, in, the, in the States at least and the mussels are from Prince Edward Island. And there was an inherent challenge between the farm, those two industries because you have nitrate and phosphate runoff pretty intensively from the potato farms going right into the sound, which is where the mussels, of course, are being harvested from. So the government was paying this farm that we visited to plant these willow buffers uh, four to eight rows deep and, and doing that as a way to see if that would, that would uh, capture that runoff before it, it hit, the, hit the sea, hit the bay. So here's kind of what it looks like inside. And what was interesting is that willow is incredibly good at partitioning nitrogen and phosphorus. So they found that over 90% of the, both the nitrogen and the phosphorus were, up, were taken up by the willow, which led to it growing about two to three times its normal rate, right? Because it's basically fertilizer for the tree. And that it allocates the nitrogen to above ground growth and the phosphorus to below ground growth. 
And then in this case, what it was being used for was it was actually being harvested on a rotation because it needed to be, it actually needed to be cut. This was now a demand because it was getting too big and it would fall over and cause problems. And at this point, they were gasifying it and using it for electricity. They were powering the whole farm off of the waste of their fertilizer runoff, right? What we're looking at in New York with the dairies is to install willow buffers to intercept the nitri nitrates and phosphates, but then harvest this and use it as a tree fodder for the livestock. Because what's happening in New York State is we're importing seaweed to feed to dairy cows to reduce their methane, which for you all is a great resource around you, potentially, and that, that's an interesting thing to check out, but we don't really have a lot of oceanfront in New York, and so the willow can potentially be a substitute for that to try to reduce our, our, our carbon output, right? So we have this multiple benefits coming from the same type of system. So I think I'll leave it there. Take a few questions.